it was just going to be a book where I said, oh, aging is not a big deal. Why are you worrying about it? Like, it's no big deal. And and what I found was, oh, the world is designed for us to hate aging. Like, like it is actually calculated by by government and corporate America and, you know, capitalist patriarchy that we hate aging, so we spend more money trying not to age, right? My name is Linda Laurel, and I'm asking you to have the courage to listen with an open mind to all of our voices, because our voices matter. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel, and this is Our Voices Matter. So I want to start by asking you a question. How do you feel about aging? What's your perspective on it? I suspect that your answer to that question will depend upon how old you are. But I want to also suggest to you that whatever your answer is, that you might not recognize that there's a reason that you feel the way that you do. And the reason is age, it turns out, is a construct. What do I mean by that? Well, if you read this book, Radiant Rebellion, Reclaim Aging, Practice Joy, and Raise a Little Hell, you will understand what I mean. Its author is Karen Walrand. Karen is a return guest here on Our Voices Matter. You've probably heard me interview her before when her book, The Lightmaker's Manifesto, came out. Um, We had a conversation. I've talked to her a couple of times on the podcast. I brought her back because this book is life-changing. You talk about light bulbs going off. We're having a conversation as a nation right now about the two men who are running for president and their age, particularly the age of one of them, the current president. It's part of the conversation about how we think about aging. So let me tell you a little bit about Karen. As I mentioned, she's the author of The Lightmaker's Manifesto, How to Work for Change Without Losing Joy. She is uh, a lawyer, a leadership coach, an activist. Um, She's been featured on Brene Brown's Unlocking Us podcast on PBS, CNN.com, and The Oprah Winfrey Show. She's a badass. And she um, challenges us to think about things in a different way. And it's based on research. So I I cannot stress to you enough how important it is um, for you to listen to this conversation and read this book because it will change the way you think about your life, whether you look forward to aging or whether you dread it, what you want it to look like or what you don't. Um, Here now, my conversation with Karen Walrand. Karen, I'm so excited to get to do this with you again. Uh, Welcome back to Our Voices Matter podcast. I'm so excited to be here. You know, I adore you. So I'm happy to be here. The feeling is mutual, my friends. So the last time we were checking in on the podcast, you were in the midst of writing the book. Mm. And uh, the book, by the way, everybody, here it is. The book is Radiant Rebellion, Reclaim Aging, Practice Joy, and Raise a Little Hell. I love that title. I love that (laughs) title. Thank you. So you were in you were in the middle of writing it. Um, Mm. Tell people, just give them a snapshot of what the book is and why you felt it was so important to write it. Yeah. So um, I wrote this book. What year was it? I guess it would have been 2022, Mm -hmm. and it was the year that I was turning 55, and my marriage was turning 20. And my daughter was turning 18. My only child was turning 18 and graduating high school and going off to college. And what I found was when I told people about all of these things, most people were only happy about the 20 year marriage. Like everybody's reaction sort of was, oh, 55. Wow. Double nickels. How you feeling? Are you okay with that? Or (laughs) um, gosh, your daughter's turning 18, empty nesting, leaving the house. How you doing, mama? Right? Like everybody kept sort of reacting like these huge things that we were like getting her out of the house and into a college she loved was sort of the goal, right? Like, so all these things were things that I was really, really excited about. I'm not a person who's ever had a problem with aging. And, um, so I really kind of wanted to delve a little deeper into what that was about, like why everybody's reaction was so negative. And especially the part where, 
um, you know, this sort of idea of 55, it's time to start slowing down, it's time to start shrinking. And, uh, and what I was seeing, not only did I disagree with that, I was looking around at all the people around me, especially all the women around me, and they were all doing amazing things that were around my age or older. They were, you know, starting podcasts or, you know, producing Broadway plays or becoming bestsellers for the first time. And, and it was, it, it just seemed completely um, at odds with sort of the reaction around me. And so I really wanted to dig into that and what it meant about aging. And I will tell you, I started writing the book thinking it was just going to be a book where I said, oh, aging is not a big deal. Why are you worrying about it? Like, it's no big deal. And and what I found was, oh, the world is designed for us to hate aging. Like, like it is actually calculated by by government and corporate America and, you know, capitalist patriarchy that we hate aging. So we spend more money trying not to age. Right. And it really sort of became this rallying cry, like, Oh, you guys need to see what's actually happening. Like this is completely a construct that we can actually love aging. Um, as soon as we sort of step off the treadmill of what the world is trying to tell us we need to be on the treadmill on. So that's what the book ended up coming. So I, 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 the book is sort of divided into all these different chapters of different aspects of aging, like health and spirituality and, um, you know, really a mission and ambition and, and, uh, just curiosity and all these different chapters. And I interview people of which you are one yeah. who I think take, approach aging in the way that I want to approach it. And I, I really sort of asked these people, like, what do I need to do? And what are sort of the things that I need to know about aging? And then I tried it, right? Like I took their advice and, and sort of write about what my experience is with that advice. And so um, there's a lot of self reflection and a lot of self interrogation. Um, with me, there's a lot of things like I sort of wake up to my own internalized ageism, which I thought I would be immune to. And, um, and really sort of map out how I want to um, evolve in my coming years. Well, the, the book is like a, it's, it's like a light bulb moment. It's an aha moment. Uh, there are places where it feels like a hug. There are places where it challenges you. Um, it's just, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, and, and not just because we're friends and, and because you interviewed me, it's really, <laughs> it, you know, what, what, first of all, you start off with the research. So yeah. I want you to, you know, give a couple of nuggets of as, the one about Alzheimer's is one yeah, and just yeah. another nugget of research that will make people sit up and go, Whoa, are you kidding me? Yeah. Okay. So I, I went into, um, I went into this, like I said, thinking that I was just going to, uh, tell people it's no big deal to age. Right. Um, but I didn't have any of the research before I went in into it. And also, um, I was sort of validated by some of the things that, that I read. So like one of the things that you mentioned was, which is the Alzheimer's research, um, research is showing that actually, the um the rates of alzheimer's is decreasing not increasing like i think we all go in thinking that alzheimer's or dementia is an inevitability right we sort of walk into that it, into grow you know growing older thinking that when it turns out the rates are decreasing right like the percentage of people getting as they get older the number is decreasing um the numbers of people who need to live in assisted living are way lower than we think right it's like around 8% i think um and most people are living just fine independently on their own. Um, yeah, of course, there are things like, you know, your memory may not be as sharp as it was when you're in your 20s, but most people are taking care of themselves fine as they get older. Um, the one thing, though, that sort of blew my mind is I mentioned that capitalist patriarchy thing. Like, it's not, you know, it's not just me saying that. There's research that that bears that out. So I, as I was doing all the research, I stumbled across the research of Laura Hirschbein, who is a doctor and a psychologist. And she wanted to find out whether or not we always hated aging, right? Like, like, is that a new phenomenon that everybody's like, oh, I don't want to get older? Or is that always been the case? And it turns out that it's not that back at the turn of the 20th century, 
um, people loved aging. And the way she did her research was she read articles from popular magazines about aging at the time. And it turns out those articles were written by people who were, you know, in the later stages of their life. They were in their 80s and their 90s, and they were writing about how much they loved aging and they loved sort of the wisdom that came with aging. And yes, of course, there's some aches and pains, but that pales in comparison to the benefits of what it means to get older. And then fast forward, there are two world wars and a Great Depression. And all of these people who are in their 80s and 90s are still working, but now we have these 30-year-olds that don't have jobs. And so the U.S. government decides we're going to have a mandatory retirement age. At 65, you need to stop working so that these 30-year-olds that who, let's face it, they're men, right, can get jobs so they can provide for their families, right? So now these 80, 65, 70-year-old, 80, 90-year-olds are no longer contributing to society. I'm using air quotes. Um, and so now they've become a burden on society, right? That's what people think. They're just draining the resources of the society, right? Coupled with that, there had nothing, never been anything called geriatrics before. So all of these child psychologists and child psychiatrists and pediatricians decide to start researching what does it mean to get older? And they use as their benchmark for normal five-year-olds. So if you are not as nimble as a five-year-old or as quick-minded as a five-year-old who, let's face it, they are designed to grow, right? Like they're five-year-olds. If you're not as quick as them mentally or physically, then you are considered impaired, right? So now aging is a problem that needs to be fixed because we all need to be as nimble as five-year-olds and as quick as five-year-olds and then enter Clairol. Clairol decides, so this is by now we're in the middle of the 20th century. Clairol decides you don't want people to know you're aging. So you better start dyeing your hair. You better start doing things to make, to appear younger because aging, I think they called it is something like the, that tyrant, that silent tyrant of gray hair. And so you have to take care of that. So literally be, between in 50 years, we went from loving aging, loving what aging brought us to, oh my God, you better hide it because you're going to be judged by it. And from there on away we go. So now it results in a trillion with a T trillion dollar largely unregulated anti-aging anti industry, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is makeup, which is everything like medicine, all kinds of things that they try to tell you it's uh, it's medical interventions, all the things that you see right. that are targeting 24 year olds. That's the target age for a lot of these things so that people don't feel like feel bad about getting older, which is a natural evolution of who you're going to be. That historical context is so mind blowing and so yeah. eye opening. I, I mean, I would guess that, you know, the vast majority of people have no idea that that's how it started. This whole, the, I found it so fascinating about the world wars and people coming back. And, you know, all of a sudden there's this at, at age 65, you know, you're put out to pasture basically. Yeah. And you're told yeah. that you no longer have the, the ability or capacity to contribute to the greater society. And yeah, you know, just, I, I talk about it like being Neo in in the Matrix, taking the blue pill. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it, you right? Like it's like you can't unsee it. Yeah, it's, like, it's amazing. I, it okay. So, wow, uh, there's so much that, that I want to <laughs> say about this. Okay, so yeah. because uh, my the the vast majority of my career, my professional career as a journalist, as sure. a broadcast journalist, you know, aging is a big piece of that. OK, yeah. so the way that that manifests itself in broadcast television, and this is purely my perspective that I'm mm -hmm. about to um, say here, um, is that um, it's OK for men to age on air and keep their jobs. Women, not so much. Yep. So if you yeah. think about it and you look at the, you know, what back during when I was on the air, so I was on the air from. Uh, as an anchor, I was on the air from 1989 to 2006. And mm -hmm. so during that time period, the, the, the norm and, and preceding that, okay, the norm was an older man and a younger woman mm -hmm. as the, mm -hmm. the anchor team. Right. And right. so the, you know, the message was always that the women had to be young. They had to be pretty. They had to look a certain way, yada, yada, yada. And the looks were way more important in many cases than the actual ability to do the job that a journalist does. Okay. Right. 
And if you're right. able to do both, wow, that's great. Okay. But, <laughs> but if you're a woman and you hit a certain age or you start to gray or you start, you know, all of a sudden they're gone. Whereas the yeah. men are allowed to gray and wrinkle, wrinkle. and mm-hmm. all of, all of the above until they decide they don't want to work there anymore, but they're yeah. not forced out. The women are forced out. And so what happens is women in the, in the industry, and I, and I personally felt like I could ne- I never wanted to talk about what my age was. Sure. I typically have looked younger than what my chronological years are. But, mm-hmm. but what happens is when people put the number on you, then all of the other stuff piles on and then they are projecting their version of what your age is supposed to be and what you are supposed to do on on you. And so I yep. was always very protective of not divulging my age. And it's sure. stupid. It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I, you know, <laughs> there's there's so many things that are coming up for me for what you're saying. Like, first of all, you said you, you stopped being an anchor in the 20, 2006, 2006, is that right? Yes. 2006. Yes. So just to put that in perspective, and I want your listeners to understand that what you've just described still exists really? and that back in 2021, no, 2022, actually the year that I wrote the book, there was a anchor in Canada who let her hair go silver over the pandemic. And when she came back to work was fired. They said, who told her? And, the, and the, the email was, who told her she could go gray during the pandemic, right? Which, so <laughs> like, so and that's, so that's what, two years ago. So that is what you've just described for yeah. sure still exists. The like, there's no, like you said, it is, you know? it is the patriarchy. It yeah. still exists. Yeah. The other thing, what you were saying about, um, about like the younger woman, older men, that's also true. I found in a lot of um, like cop shows and actually what, what <laughs> right. really, yeah, like you always have sort of the wizened old uh, like detective who's a guy and then the young ingenue, young detective who's learning from him. And one of the things that I noticed was I was watching one of those shows. It was a, it was actually a, a British show on the BBC or one of the um, British channels. And they did a close up of the young woman and I noticed a silver hair. And I went, how old is she? And I went and I looked, looked up her age and she was like in her early 30s. She was young. And my first thought was you would never see that on an American show. Like you would never see a yeah. young 30 year old and, it, and let's face it, or 40 or 50 in a lot of ways with people who are silver haired, right? Like, so, but certainly not that young. And I thought For how sure. interesting, like that's clearly a cultural thing. Like, I, and I think that's not to say that I think that England is that much more evolved. I mean, I think honestly, the ageism is a worldwide thing. I think the World Health Organization says one in two people a- around the world hold ageist, um, ageist beliefs. So that is definitely not, that's not to say that I think England is better, but it was really interesting to see that sort of difference in what would be allowed on television and what wouldn't. Now, the other thing that I, that came up for me is what you said about people projecting sort of the meaning of age on mm-hmm. you. Ew. What's really funny about that is, and this was part of the research that I found, is that if you think about it, we all have far more in common when we're younger and we age at different rates and we age differently and become far more diverse as we get older. So, for example, five-year-olds tend to have far more in common than 15-year-olds than 25-year-olds, than 55-year-olds, than 95-year-olds, right? Because as we age, our race plays a uh, part in it, our wealth or lack thereof plays a part in it, our access to healthcare plays a part in it, Uh, the stressors that we have in our lives all play a part of it. So every single person becomes far more different from the people in their age group than every other person. So the idea of saying, oh, she's 50, that definitely means X, is bananas, Because 50 can be anything. 50 can be somebody who is silver haired and, or it could be Halle Berry who seems preternaturally young, for example. So like the idea of saying what old should be or what young is, is it makes no sense the older and younger that we get. It's a spectrum and we all do it at different rates. 
I love it. It's a spectrum. Right. Yeah. And and we all do it at, at different rates. You know, absolutely. One one 50 year old is not the same as another 50 year old. And all of those factors and things that you just talked about, you know, are, are part of what makes that individual who they are in that particular moment. Um, and the whole, you know, the whole retirement thing, um, I, you know, people ask me all the time or, or people will come up to me and say, since I'm not on, t- on television anymore, but I'm still very visible in the community and I'm probably busier now than I ever was, you know, mm-hmm. when I was on TV every night. Um, but people are like, oh, are you retired now? And I'm like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not retired. I just, I don't work in television anymore, but I, I run a business. And by the way, I don't ever plan to retire. Right. And I'm serious. What does retire mean what, anymore? What does right? that mean? All of this. I mean, I'm I'm gonna what? Um, you know, binge movies and play tennis and golf and go on. The, I mean, I, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Absolutely. I, I just. I mean, I just feel like there's so much to do. And I was I was talking to somebody about this last night. Um, and it's just I just feel as though. Um, Oh, I actually was talking to Dr. Rita about this yesterday. Uh, right. Dr. Rita Achari, who is uh, in, also one of the people that Karen interviewed in her book. I'm talking to the audience now. So Dr. Rita Achari, she's amazing. Um, and Karen introduced me to her and I had an appointment with her yesterday and we were talking about, um, you know, some of some of this stuff, you know, how I'm doing. I have a history of Alzheimer's in my family. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned about that. You know, we were talking about all of that. And, and I was telling her, I said, you know, I'm never going to retire. I said, and I feel as though um, that I am at a point where I'm really just getting started in terms of coming into my own and being able to offer the world all of the experience and um, expertise that I have acquired over my 68 years. Mm. I've never just said out loud to people when I like on the podcast, how old I am. I'm 68. Mm-hmm. I just came back from a, um, a reunion, a summit of Stanford national black alumni association. So all the black people who have gone to Stanford through the years. Okay. So there were people there from the sixties who grad, mm. I mean, black people who graduated from Stanford in the sixties, that was like the first class. The first right. classes. Okay. Then there was the seventies and then all the way up until, you know, today. Right. And so they ask each class, you know, if whoever's in the audience, you know, what first, the, one of the first things we do is, okay, sixties stand up and people are like, you know, screaming and yelling. Cause there are a few that are there. Seventies. I was in the seventies. I graduated right. from Stanford in 1977. Yep. And throughout the the evening or throughout the, the weekend, you know, you're wearing a badge that says your name and the year you graduated and so you'd be talking to people and you say, hey, I'm so and so class of blah, blah, blah. And I say, hi, I'm Linda class of 77. And right. they look at me like, huh? Right. I'm like, and that, this is not me trying to make, you know, make myself feel good. But they were like, well, you don't look like you graduated in 77. I was thinking maybe 97. You know, mm-hmm. like you look younger than what your years mm-hmm. are. And I, you know, and so I started sort of wearing it like a badge. It's like, hi, I'm an OG and I'm proud of it. Right. 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 And, right. And when I think of like when I was at Stanford in the 70s, I didn't realize what a big deal that was to be at an elite PWI, predominantly white institution. Yep. As a black person. Yeah. And that in some ways that was kind of trailblazing. I didn't, I mean, I get it now because I understand the juxtaposition and the history of it. I didn't get it back yeah. then, but now I'm so enormously proud of it. And, mm-hmm. and I feel like that the experience of being in the room and embracing the history and the trajectory and the the ability to connect with the younger generation and for mm-hmm. th- what I want them to see when they look at me is that this is what 68 looks mm-hmm. like. This yep. is what 68 can do. Yep. Barbara Walters started the view when she was 68. Right. Yeah. She started the view when she was 68. Then- I feel like I'm starting the the chapter of my life that is 
going to be the most impactful for me personally, professionally, and for everything that I have to offer to the world. And yet society says I should have hung up my shacks or right. hung up my, you know, my shingle, what, three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. It is. It is ridiculous. And what I'm finding, it's so f- interesting because I literally, I just came back from speaking on a panel um, about ambition as you get older and the difference, how ambition changes when you get older. Right. So um, like, I think what you, to your point, I think what a lot of people will say, well, you lose your ambition when you get older, you don't become as ambitious or, um, and what the panel was saying and, and on the panel was, um, a couple of other writers, one of, and, and, and an editor, Kim France, who, you, who was the, uh, founder of SAS, of Sassy magazine back in the nineties and, um, who just celebrated her 60th birthday. And, um, another woman who was younger than both of us, I think she probably just turned 50. And we were talking about, um, about how, ambition becomes, it doesn't go away, but it does sort of transform. And I think it should transform. And there were a lot of people in the audience. It was, it was, I was actually really surprised because this conference I've been to many times and usually it skews younger. So I didn't expect the room to be as filled with people who were, I would guess probably 40 and over in the, in the room. Um, And what I found was that there's this idea of sort of 30 under 30 and 40 under 40, right? Like we, we get these sort of messaging all the time about you have to, have to, have to achieve whatever that whatever achieve means by a certain age. And then after that, you may be washed up. Right. And, and you might as well give up, right? Like you might as well stop changing. So that was one thing that sort of, we were sort of, wrestling with in the room. The other thing I think was, uh, the idea of relevance, like how do you stay relevant as you get older and what does that mean? And I've always, I'm, I'm always very intrigued by that word. Like people are like, I just want to be relevant. I want to stay relevant. And my thinking about it is, is as you get older, you are the person in the room who has all of this experience, right? Like, would you ever say, for example, if Oprah Winfrey came to work for your company, well, is she relevant? Like, you would sit there and you would think, right. she's got all this experience and this, like, what kind of amazing perspective does she bring because of all of this work that she's done in her past? And so the idea of staying relevant, um, I prefer the idea of staying curious, like you said, right? Like, for me, that is really sort of the key to aging is to constantly challenge yourself, your perspectives, your, um, your mindset, what's interesting to you, figuring out what new things can be interesting to you. To me, that is the secret sauce, right? Like that's yeah. it. As long as you're doing that, you're fine. Yeah. And as long as you talk about that, and I, I mean, as lo- not as long as you talk about that, but as long as you really live that, like relevance becomes sort of on the sideline. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting um, and I know you, you, or you, or you do a lot in politics and, and that kind of thing. One of the things I think is really interesting in politics right now is yeah. how much age is becoming I was just going to bring that up. I'm so glad. Right. Yeah, go for it. Go <laughs> right. for and, it. Yeah. And so people will talk about, well, Biden is so old and, you know, and they don't talk about it with, with Trump, even though they're within the same age of each other. Or we say things like, um, they're, they're too old to run. Like, why are, why, why don't we have young people running, why, you know, for president, it shouldn't be people who are in their eighties. And yet nobody ever said that about Bernie Sanders, for example, who was always considered very relevant and everything. Right. So the, I think the idea, if we can stop saying like, this person is too old to run, or why does it have to be too old? More think about how are they staying up to date with the issues that affect people of all generations? Because if they're doing that, their age is really like, first of all, are they impaired? Irrelevant. That's what, Irrelevant, right? Like, right? exactly. <laughs> right. Like you want to make sure they're not impaired. Like, but like right. Mitch McConnell's a great example, right? Like yeah. people were like, well, he's too old to do that. Is he too old or is something physically happening with him that makes him unable to do the job? Right. right? They may or if may he, not have anything to do with his age. But may way. or may not have, right. likely, frankly, doesn't. Because if you think of 
Jane Fonda, who's the same age, like nobody, like, does anybody ever think Jane Fonda can't do anything? Right? Like, there's nothing that's that's stopping Jane Fonda from doing anything. So but it's about a health issue, or it's about a, you know, a cognition issue. It's about something else. Like get very, very granular. Mm -hmm. about what that means. Same thing with what you said about going to Stanford and having people going, oh, you don't look your age. You know what? Linda, you look exactly what 68 is supposed to look like on Linda Laurel, right? Right. You like when people tell me that all the time, they're like, oh, well, you don't look your age. And it could mean older or younger. My hair is white. So it could be anything Mm -hmm. else. I'm like, no, I actually look exactly like what 56 is supposed to look like for Karen Walrand, right? And so what you're saying projecting on me about what that age should look like is th- that's that it makes it we all age at different rates so when people look at you and they go oh you don't look 68 that's more about them than it is about you right like that's exactly. more about whatever the that's stereotype your, that's your is your idea of what 68 is supposed to right. look like Right. right. That's a your yeah. stereotype. It's not about me. Yeah. 68. So people tell me that all the time, like, oh, my gosh, Karen, you know, happy birthday. You look mm-hmm. you look so great for your age. Well, thank you. But I hope you think I look so great. Right. Yeah, like exactly. one. Yeah. Right. It's not yeah. before my age or if like, oh, Karen, you don't look 50. I'm going to be 50. How old am I going to be? 57 this year. If you don't look 57. I'll be like, no, I, I actually look exactly like what 57 looks like, given my history, given my access to health care, given my, you know, like education, given all given the stress I've had in my life. This is what it looks like. Right. Like that. This is absolutely what it looks like. And I'm very, very comfortable with what that looks like. You know, it's interesting. Um, a minute ago, you, you, you just talked about uh, the younger people, you know, feeling as though, you know, it's like 40 under 40, 30 under 30. Yeah. And it's like there's this um, there's this metric that yeah. if you haven't achieved X by the time you're 30, then you're washed up. That's I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing that a little bit, um, with Lindsay, don't get mad at me, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> so my daughter's 29. Um, and you know, there's, there's so many, um, young people her age who have started companies and made their first million and, you know, done this and done that. And, you know, you, you sort of look at your peers in terms of the age group and you're thinking, well, I'm not, I, I'm not doing that. Well, mm-hmm. that's okay. You know, you don't compare yourself to what everybody else is doing. You have your own journey. You have your own race to run and focus on what it is that, that makes you, you, you know, to determine what that's going to be for you, but not compared to everybody else. And this is another piece of the construct that says, that's the capitalist patriarchy talking, right? That's it. If you haven't done this by a certain time, then you're not worthy, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, it's just, I don't know. And then there's the the whole anti-aging thing, you know, with, with younger people, going in for plastic surgery and Botox in their twenties. I mean, come on, like the tiniest little wrinkle all of a sudden means I've got to go do some artificial thing to my body because I don't want to be perceived as older than I am. And and what would happen if we thought of wrinkles as beautiful? Like what would happen if we just shifted that and said, you know what? I can't wait to get the laugh lines and everything because they're beautiful. Like suddenly like that shifts everything. And, you know, you talk about your daughter, my daughter just celebrated her 20th birthday. And she was upset about it. She's like, I can't believe I'm 20. I'm not a teenager anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> kid, you know, like, are you serious? You oh know, like, it's, and, but like, but I get it. Because yeah, like I, I said, the That's anti-aging correct. industry is targeting kids that are 24 yeah. years old. So of course, that's how she feels. Like, why would she feel that way? And the idea of a spectrum, like I'm sure she looks at me and my 57 year old butt and thinks, Oh my God, <laughs> you're ancient. But then my 85 year old mother, it looks at yeah. me and thinks I'm so young. Like it's yeah. such a, it is right. such a spectrum. Like you can't. So for me, like one of the things that I always watch is how I use the words old and young. Right. And this was like one of the biggest ahas in the book because I interviewed um, Ashton Applewhite, who is this great anti-ageism activist. And she was the one who taught me, like, be careful how you use those words. And I remember thinking, well, and asking her, what what, old is old and young is young? Like, what's wrong with it? She goes, well, I hear people say, for example, I don't feel old. And I said, well, I say that all the time. I don't feel old. And she said, well, Karen, when you say that, I suspect what you're saying is I don't feel irrelevant. I don't feel unsexy. 
I, I don't feel, um, you know, diminished or whatever. And I said, yes. And she said, well, if you think about it, like, I don't know about you, but when I was 13, I had spells where I felt irrelevant and unsexy and diminished. She goes, those aren't age related terms, right? And we use old as shorthand for bad and young as shorthand for good. And we don't even realize we're using it. Like, we don't even notice we're doing it. And for me, it was like, oh my God, that's right. Like, even the phrase, I don't feel old is an ageist phrase. Right. Like it just it what, speaks to how much we've internalized the messaging. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I'm very, very careful about saying things like, like if I'm speaking to somebody who's younger than me, like I never say, well, I'm old. So I think such and such. I might say, well, I'm older than you. And so my experience is such and such or my I'm older than you. So this is what I think. But it's never I'm old as sort of a well, you know, I'm ancient yeah. back in the yeah. ancient, you know, back yeah. in the old I days. I and I went, Yeah, right. Yeah. And I went it's, to college back it, in the Stone Age. It's like it, there's there's no yeah. reason to be doing that. Right. Like like I, I love that you're like, well, 77 and I wore it as a badge of honor because you should wear like you. I, I graduated in 88 and somebody emailed me the other day and said, I went to university with you. And I remember you were the only black woman in the civil engineering department. And I was like, was I like, I didn't, it didn't even like, I knew I was like one of the few black people in the school, mm -hmm. but it was the first time that, that I was like, Oh, and I'm like, that's kind of badass, <laughs> right? Like, like that, that was, that was my experience. And so really sort of, embracing the experiences that you've had and what you've done in your life and realizing that they are all arrows in your quiver as you become an elder, right? As you become something that can model for younger people, like this is how you embrace getting older, that I am all for. And I think that's exactly right. And exactly the, um, how we should create and curate our coming years. It's like, how do I become an elder, right? How do I become somebody that younger people can look to and go, that's where I want to be. That's how I want to age. That's how I want to approach life. That is where I want to go. And it has nothing to do with money and it has nothing to do with accolades, right? It's just about how am I living in a way that younger people coming up can go, I want to live that way. I want to live with that mindset. I think that's, that's the secret sauce. Oh my gosh. I, I just, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. So, um, and we could go on and on, but, um, I, I want you to, I want you to, as we start to wrap this up, um, mm. one of the things that you do in the book is that you, you, as you said, you take us on your own journey, but you also, um, give us the tools to take the journey on our own and ask the questions. And you went through this whole, um, scenario where you asked yourself a series of questions and then you arrived at what you call a spark statement. And you had yeah. one before you went into this book and it changed by the time you had gotten to, to writing the book. So talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to, to close us out by reading your new spark statement. Yeah. So uh, the spark statement is sort of a, you know, a, a, a less corporate um, name for a mission statement. And I will tell you when I was a kid, my dad was like, we should have a family mission statement. My dad was corporate, a very corporate uh, executive. Um, and I remember as kids, we were like, dad, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but, but as I've gotten older, like I sort of see the point of having a, um, and it's, it's a poem or a statement that sort of is, helps you anchor to what you want to stand for and how do you want to live? And I had written one um, for myself, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, maybe a little bit, a bit, a little bit more than a decade ago. And it was like, this is how I want to approach my life. And I, as I was writing the book, I thought, let me go back to that and see if it still rings true for me. Um, and a lot of it did, but also 10 years had passed and I had grown and I'd been through all these other experiences and there were other things that had sort of shifted in importance for me. And so I revisited it in the book and wrote one um, for hopefully how I want to live maybe for the next 10 years. And then in 10 years, I'll probably look at it again. So it's sort of an evolving thing. So I will read it. Um, and, uh, this for me feels like, uh, yeah, it feels like sort of like my, my, um, my, the way that I want to move through the world, at least, uh, for now. So despite the darkness, there is always light and it exists in each of us no matter our race or national origin, but because of it, no matter our gender, 
but because of it. No matter how we love, but because of it. And no matter our age, because of it. Using everything I am and have been, my culture, my talents, my education, and my experience, I convince the skeptical of their uncommon light, illustrating the inherent power we each have to make the world a better place. May my words and images shine bright enough to extinguish the darkness of negativity, violence, and discrimination, and instead illuminate positivity, peace, kindness, and joy. May I model living an expansive life by accepting all opportunities for cultivating growth and play and, above all, adventure. Mm. Oh, it just gives me chills. Um, It's just what a beautiful way to approach living your life. And I just think that um, I just love you. I just love you so (laughs) much. I love you back. I love the the light (laughs) and the love that you exude with every fiber of your being and how you spread it into the world through your work, through your words, through your actions. And I mean... Just, it's such a gift to have you in my life and such a gift to share you with the Our Voices Matter audience. Thank you so much. Just oh my gosh. You. Well, I feel exactly the same about you and it is always an honor to be part of anything you do. So thank you so much for having me. Can't wait for the next book. Yeah, <laughs> me too. That's a tease. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, friend. Did I tell you or did I tell you? Right? Okay. So now I wonder, has the answer to the question, how do you feel about aging, changed? Has it changed at all after listening to that conversation and what Karen had to share with us? It's so eye-opening and so mind-blowing to me. Um, it, this book helped free me from some of, the own, some of my own ideas and preconceived notions about aging and moving through the world. We should all just be free to be who we are and we should embrace the stage of life that we're in. You know, we're blessed. We're blessed to still be here and have the opportunity to live the life that we want to create for ourselves. Again, the book is Radiant Rebellion, Reclaim Aging, Practice Joy, and Raise a Little Hell. You know what to do. Thank you so much for joining us. Like, side, like, subscribe, share, and then uh, come back and join us again next time. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great one.